So we move into chapter 8 now. This is a very practical chapter. You see a lot of friction and a lot of systems. Um, and it really brings together a lot of concepts that we had already. So we're going to be able to cover just the first two sections. Next time we'll be able to cover some more. And then the very end, like uh, 8, 6, 8, 7, 8, 8, we're, we're not, we're not uh, covering it. We're, we're skipping those sections. So we're interested in what we call dry friction. Okay, well, you have two contacting surfaces. Maybe one you just think of as not moving, a floor, a ground, very stationary, and you have an object on it. And there can be a reaction between those two surfaces. If it had a weight W, you could have a normal reaction N. But also if you had a load trying to pull it to the side, it could develop a frictional force in this interface, and that frictional force um, acts a lot. It's, it's an aggregate over the entire surface, and it would resist the possible movement that P would want to induce or cause. So we have two contacting surfaces. Uh, the friction is the force to resist the possible movement in that possible direction. It's tangent to the surface, so what we have is a normal and then tangential uh, forces. And uh, when we talk about dry friction, we have no lubrication, so there's no fluids. Uh, fluid mechanics, you'll deal with lubrication and you do with viscosity and do with uh, velocity profiles and shear stresses, but here it's just dry. So what is N? In your words, normal force. What is P? Some load that wants to cause a slipping or cause a motion of those two surfaces. And F is that frictional force that resists opposite of P. So we have a maximum frictional force. Now I wish the book would have maybe had longer subscripts, but I know that they try to economize on subscripts. But we have that this is that tangential frictional force. And when you have an S, you would think, well, that's a static, static frictional force. But I, you know, if I was the author of the book, I'd probably put something like max or something extra, but the book doesn't, so I'll try to be consistent with the book. And what this is, is it's the a mu, a property of the surfaces, the two surfaces together. So it's the co coefficient of static friction, mu sub s, times the magnitude of that normal force. That gives us the limiting or the maximum frictional force. Often our frictional force is less than the limiting, less than that maximum frictional force. It's not on the verge of slipping it's far away from slipping. But, um, but the book doesn't do that. The book just talks about F of S as a static frictional force, and it implies that that's the limiting or the maximum, which is just the product of this, these two components. So if, F, if P is less than that limiting frictional force, then the responding frictional force is equal to the load. Okay, let's do this. I have an object on the surface. I say that if I pull with 50 pound force, it's just going to start slipping. Actually, then basically it just told me that F of S is 50 pounds. Okay, but I don't pull with 50 pounds. I pull with 40 pounds. P is equal to 40 pounds. Okay, what's going to happen? Are you going to have a frictional force of 50 pounds in the opposite direction? No. You're going to have a frictional force of 40 pounds in the opposite direction, so you drop the S. It's not a maximum, but it's still a static friction. So I'm just highlighting the, the, note, the subscript notation could be a little confusing. I wish they would have always left an F of S on it, but what they'll do is they'll have this is at contact A. All right, well, they said, we're going to put the frictional force at A. 
or contact force at B or C or D or whatever point for that contact. So that's why they, I think one of the reasons the author doesn't put an S, it would be the F of S comma A or comma D or whatever point it is. All right. Typical values for that coefficient of static friction. So metal on ice. Anybody been ice skating? And that's a very low coefficient of static friction. Uh, wood on wood can be a uh, wider range and qu can be quite high. And then even copper on copper, two dis metals like that, they would have a very large coefficient of static friction. First clicker question. The coefficient of static friction can be negative, either true or false. Well, what is our symbol for the coefficient of static friction? Isn't that mu subscript s? And how would we use it? We'd say, oh, the frictional force, the limiting frictional force is that coefficient of static friction times that normal force. But, you know, if you allowed mu sub s to be negative, you'd actually change the direction. It'd be like actually in the direction of p. The direction, it, it would make no sense. Just, it doesn't make any sense that it would be negative. Uh, so, the coefficient of static friction can be negative. No. This no good. I don't know if two people said yes, but we'll leave it that. Okay. Let's do this. Let's continue on. The coefficient of static friction can be greater than 100% true or false. Well, this is one of those where I knew I was going to ask this question so I didn't sit there on the previous slide and say, look at this number, look at this number. But right now I want to go back to that previous slide and say, look at this number, look at this number. Because what about this number right here? Isn't that interesting? Most people will answer the way you answered even if I ask seniors about ready to graduate. But it's in your statics book and it's well documented that yes, you can have a, a coefficient of static friction greater than one. There's no, it can't be less than zero. It can be close to zero if they slide very easily like the metal on ice, but it can be very high as well. It can be greater than one. Now, is it routinely greater than one? No but it can be greater than one. Isn't this greater than 100%? What's 100%? One. All right, so let's go back and go ahead and grade that. So the coefficient of static friction can be greater than 100%. That's true. But this is about the distribution that we'll get, like I say. So please, if you can remember that, that would help you in the long run. All right, let's go on. All right, the coefficient of static friction is empirical. So I guess this question begs, you know, what does this word empirical mean? Em empirical? It sounds like experimental, doesn't it? So if you had a number that was empirically based, it just came from measurements, observations. That's, that's empirical. So theoretical is kind of the opposite. Empirical basically is it's based on observations. And yes, a lot of engineering coefficients, that's how you determine them. You have a framework, and then you say, well, we expect this constant of proportionality to be in this range, go out, make some measurements, here it is. So it is the coefficient of static friction is empirical. All right, yeah, a lot of you had it right. So if the contact area increases, then the static frictional force will increase. True 
or false. The answer is uh, right here. What is that equation? f of s is equal to mu of s times n. In that equation, where is a? Non-existent. And so if the contact area increases, but n remains the same and the coefficient remains the same, then there's no change. So really, you don't see A's in these equations. So let's just go ahead and grade it. Oh, look at that. Pretty well split. If the contact area increases, then the static frictional force will increase. That is not true. All right? Somebody says, but if I increase the, the, the cross-sectional area, doesn't that mean I have a bigger chunk with the heavier? Well, it could. It could mean that the n goes up because maybe n is proportional to a, but that's implicit. It's not explicit in the equation. All right. What happens when p, okay, let's go back to our problem. Here's our system. It's a block. It's sitting on a surface. Uh, the surface is not moving. The ground is not moving, and you're going to load it with p. That's our notation for p is our load. What happens when P is less than F of S? What again was F of S? The limiting frictional, static frictional force. All right. So let's go ahead. What will happen when that is true? Done. All right. That was a pretty easy question, wasn't it? I'm glad to see that. So, it remains stationary. All right, let's try this one. Okay. What happens when P is greater than F of S? All right. Now, this is good. 100% correct. So when it's greater than, the object will move. Friction can't hold it there, and it'll move in that direction, P. All right, when F is greater than F of S, let's do this question. What was F of S in words? The maximum or limiting static friction force. And it's opposing P. P wants to move it in that direction. It's going to impede or impose it. What was F? I know I, I want to throw a subscript on it, but it's the actual friction force. The actual can't be greater than the maximum. So this will never happen. It just won't happen. All right. Well, what happens if P is greater than the limiting frictional force? Then you're going to get slip. And that's one of our motions. We're going to talk about slipping and tipping of objects. And uh, slipping is when that's true. Okay, now, when in this class we have very slow slipping, it's a very slow gliding along. We're not going to be interested in the acceleration. Hey, we have to leave something for the next class. Dynamics, right? And we're not going to be interested in aerodynamic lubrication. And there are even some bearings that use air for the lubricant. So forget it. We're not going fast. We're just going to have slow slipping. And then in that case, we will have a new equation for that frictional force, which is still opposed to the slipping, and it's mu of k times n. It's still proportional to the normal force. And what is that coefficient mu of k? Well, it's the coefficient of, instead of s for static, k for kinetic friction. Now, the book does not go 
into that in great detail at all. It's just a little reference to it. But mu of k, if you were you know, needed to have a number, it's about 75% of the static friction. It's like once you start to slip on in the picture, the book has some uh, pictures of looking at a microscope at the ridges here like that. Then what will happen is, let's say, this block on top of this other block will actually rise up a little bit, knock off the tops of the mountains, and it will actually reduce that coefficient. That's why 75% that coefficient of friction, the kinetic is about 75% of the static. Makes sense. But is this a hard number? No, it's just empirical. Rule of thumb. Now, what we want to do is plot. This is one of the more confusing plots in our textbook. We don't have a whole lot of plots anyway in our textbook, but here is one. So we have, go back to the reference, we have a block. Let's call that block A, and it has a normal force, N sub A. That normal force could equal to the weight of A, but you know what? All I have to do is put a spring there on top and sort of lift it a little bit, but not completely off. And so N sub A is not always just the weight of the block, okay? But often it is equal to the weight of the block, the weight coming down. And then we're going to have a load P pulling it, and then you'll have that frictional force that responds to it. And so what we want to do is we want to start off with P. What again is P on the x-axis? Maybe it's the amount of pounds, how many pounds you're pulling on the object to make it want to slide. All right. Well, what are you going to plot on this y-axis? F. Are you going to... So if I pull with nothing, I get no frictional uh, uh, force that impedes the possible motion. So it starts at zero, zero. And if I pull with one pound, it goes one pound, two pounds, two pounds. And so this line, this first section, is a one for one. It almost makes too much sense. But it gets up to a value that is called F of S, the limiting. And we know the equation for what that F of S is. That's equal to the mu of S. Oh, I forgot the name of mu sub S. What is the name of mu sub S? What is the name of that? Coefficient of static friction. That's right. That's exactly right. And so it's multiplied by N, that normal force at that contact. Then what happens when you get up to this critical point? You can't keep going, can you? If you keep loading it with a higher load, What's going to happen? Slip. And as soon as it starts to slip, the frictional force goes to only mu of k times n. And if you want to do it graphically, oh, it's about 75%. So it drops down to that not static, limiting static frictional force, but the kinetic frictional force, which was mu of k times n, and it drops, and then it goes on. Now, you say this class is interested in everything in this range with a, with a smidgen over p before it starts to slip. But once it starts to slip, you go and if you want a detailed analysis, go to the dynamics class, go to your fluid mechanics class, go to another class, right? We have many follow-on engineering classes after statics. But this is where you're going to get acceleration, aren't you? And that possible lubrication due to the aerodynamics. But this is the hard part because a lot of people... They love equations. They love, and they saw the book, F, S is equal to mu sub S, N. And every time there's a friction force, it's mu sub S times N. Is it? Most of the time, most of the time, F is less than F of S. Most of the time, the actual friction force at that surface is a lot lower than the limiting and you don't have slipping, and you're not, on the, you're not on the cusp of beginning to slip. All right. 
Oh, another clicker question. The blank static frictional force equals mu sub s times n. The actual, the maximum, the minimum, the tangent, the perpendicular. Well, we, we just ended a talk about how f can be often less than f of s, right? But both of those forces are tangent to the surface, and really it's that limiting, it's the maximum. So there you go. The, the maximum static frictional force equals mu sub s times n. All right, let's do this one then. Okay, when slipping is about to occur, the frictional force is blah, 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 blah. Which one? Is answer A correct? Hold it, it's less. It has to be equal, isn't it? Isn't it just going to be equal to mu sub s time? Is that okay? I think I'm done with uh, multiple choice clicker questions that I had pre-programmed before the class. Let me see if there's any more. Nope. Now it's on to solving problems. So now let's just start solving problems. So here's the first problem. We have a coefficient of static friction between the drum and the brake bar is 0.4. Well, here is the drum, and here is our brake bar right there. And the contact point is B. Do you see that? Contact at B. And so the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.4. If the moment applied to the drum is 35 newton meter, so this is our moment, and it's 35 newton meter. Are those good units for a uh, moment? Yeah, they are. That's good. And the direction is shown, okay? Using our right-hand rule, if this was the X and the Y and the Z coming out, would that be a positive sense in the Z or a negative? Be positive. Be positive. That's good. Okay. De okay, so determine the smallest force P. Where is P? That's what this hand loads up on this bar, downward force P that needs to be applied to the brake bar in order to prevent the drum from rotating. So just envision this as it's stationary, nothing's moving, but this moment makes it want to rotate, that drum to rotate. And by having a load P onto that brake bar, you are preventing it from rotating. Now, you could really pull down on P, and you could have an excessive load down to stop it from rotating. But we want the smallest force P, meaning if, if, if you dropped it a little bit, maybe, maybe the smallest force is 50 pounds, but maybe if you only applied 30, it would start slipping, right? All right, so it's the smallest force P. How would we want to solve this problem? Well, going to do a free body diagram of the drum. Do free body diagram of that bar. Okay, so we'll have two free body diagrams. So if you do a free body diagram of the drum, it's like this. Here is our point O. Here is our point B. This is that moment, to maybe try and color it a little like this, that's applied. And so M is equal to 35 Newton meter. And at this contact B, okay, first of all, I do have some support at, at, the, at the point O. So maybe I have, I don't know, let me do this one. Think about it. Which way is the normal force at the point B acting on the drum? Is it downward directed? Should I put N sub B like that? Or should I turn it around and put it upward directed? N sub B. 
I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to pause. I want you to give me the free body diagram of the drum. It's only a 2D free body diagram, and in it I'm going to be interested in the direction of n sub b, and then I'm going to be interested in the direction of f. And because it's at that limiting, it really is the equation fs. We're going to put that in. That's the limiting frictional force in that case. But I want you to pay particular attention there. And then the next free body diagram you want to do, you want to do one, I'm miniaturizing it a little bit, of this bar. And here what we're going to do is put P downward directed. That's the positive direction of P shown in the illustration. Let's not change that. We'll have a reaction over here at A, just like I have a reaction at O. And you, you may want to think about, do I need to put anything at O in the drum free body diagram? Yes or no? Likewise at A. And then I have B right there, point B. So give me the free body diagrams of both of those. I'm going to pause, walk around, see what you got. All right, let me pick it up here. So uh, the bar is going to actually be pushing down on the drum. And the drum is going to be pushing back up on the bar. So if you just figure it out that way, this is your N at B that the bar feels because of the drum. And this is the N of B that the drum feels because the bar is pushing down on it. If you get the directions right, it'll really ease our work in the future. Now, the drum wants to rotate in that counterclockwise direction. And so the frictional force is going to oppose it. Maybe you put it out like this instead of that way. Maybe you, it doesn't really matter. But you'll have F at B. Now, we already know it's, we're doing the limiting case, and it's going to be F S comma B, which means that's one of the times I can replace that static frictional force by mu sub S times N. All right. Then we have at the O, I, I, I talked to a few people, there's a pin at O. What happens if that pin broke and I'm pulling down on this bar? Do you think the drum is going to fly up? No, the drum is going to fall down, isn't it? And so the direction of the O and the Y is upward. And I know this O is in my way right there. The direction for O in the X is to the, what do you call that? To the uh, left, because F B is to the right. Did I, did, do you agree with all those directions? All right. And then the last one is I have to put up here. Do I have to put here F S B in the equal and opposite? So the bar feels it trying to be pulled to the left because of that rotation of the drum. All right, then we'll finish it out. This is probably the direction of AX. And this is probably the direction of AY. If you don't like it, do this. Take and do this game. The pin at, a, the pin at O holds. I'm pulling down hard with P. The pin at A breaks. Which way does the bar go? If the pin at A breaks, does the bar fly up or does the bar shoot down? It's going to fly up, isn't it? So guess what? AY is in the positive direction downward. AY is positive direction downward. Okay, uh, that's a hard part of the job. <laughs> now that we have our free body diagrams, we want to calculate this P minimum, right? The minimum the minimum is going to give us F of S, that maximum or limiting frictional force. All right. Because what happens if P gets larger, larger? Doesn't NB get larger, larger, larger? And then it's easier to hold the drum stationary because of that frictional equ equ equation.
let's do, uh, we have our equations. You can do the sum of the moments around point O for the drum. That's our equilibrium equation. What does that give us? FBS or FS, maybe. FS at B is equal t times uh, this distance right here of 0.125 meter is equal to 35 newton meter. Some of the moments around point O. Does OX or OY contribute to that equation? No. Does N sub B contribute to that equation? No. One makes it want to spin or rotate in the clockwise direction, one in the opposite. This is, this. maybe I should have left this as FSB times a, a moment arm equal to M at O. What's the only unknown in this equation? Guess what FSB is? 280 newtons, true? All right. So now we know what that FSB is. We know the coefficient of static friction. What does N sub B need to be from our friction equation? If it's FSB divided by mu sub S at B, that comes in at 700 Newton. So we need that downward. The, the load on, the, on that lever arm needs to create a normal force at B of 700 Newtons. You can come over now to the lever arm free body diagram. Sum of the moments about A. And I'm going to pause and I'm going to walk around. I want you to do the sum of the moments about point A for which free body diagram? The lever. And then you'll have one equation with one unknown, solve for P. And be careful, because I suspect some of So when you do the sum of the moments around point A, you get one equation. Uh, I'm glad that a lot of people did not forget FS in that sum of the moments equation, which is easy to do. And then they get that the P minimum is 350 Newton. What happens if you pull down with 550 Newton? It's a lot further away from the possibility of slipping at point B. That's what it is. Does it change the magnitude of F of S at, well, F at B then? We would not, we would drop that S. Would it change this, the magnitude of this frictional force at B if you pulled down with, let's say, 500 Newtons? No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. It just would mean that that frictional force is lower than the limiting frictional force. Why do I repeat myself so often? Because I know it's conceptually a very difficult area. We have a 10-foot ladder, and it leans against the smooth wall. This is a very interesting word describing the wall. Can you tell me what is the coefficient of static friction for the wall and the ladder that are in contact? Zero. Zero. There's no frictional force with the ladder and the wall. So we make a little thing like this. This is our wall. And we put our ladder in like this. And our ladder has a length of 10 foot ladder. Okay, That's our length of our ladder. And it's against a smooth wall. Right away, that wall can generate a normal reaction force propping up or against that ladder. But no frictional force. None. No frictional force on that ladder at the top. Okay. It's uh, at an inclination of 60 degrees with the ground. So right here we can draw this, say this is 60 degrees. And it has a static friction coefficient with the ground of 0.4. So mu sub s with the ground is 0.4. The ground here, the bottom of the ladder. Okay. The weight of the ladder is negligible. A 180-pound man climbs the ladder, so you can think of this person begins right at the bottom, then goes up higher, higher, higher. As the person climbs the ladder, holding on to the ladder, right, on the ladder, 
you can think about what's changing the location of the center of gravity of the 180 pound man as they climb the ladder. See that? What I'm trying to draw it as different locations. All right. How far from the ladder base that's in contact with the ground toward the wall is man's center of gravity when the ladder starts to slip? Well, hopefully the ladder never slips on you or me. So you think about moving from this location. I need to get rid of that mu sub s. This location over x. So x starts at 0 and it moves over. And we want to find that location moving toward the wall where this is the center of gravity of the 180 pound man on the ladder where, when it begins to slip. And so this is the ladder free body diagram. And we're going to have n at the top. Maybe we call this point B and maybe down here point A, contact point A. We'll have n at A. And to prevent slipping, think about it. which way would the ladder slip? Would the ladder slip such that the base went toward the wall or away from the wall? You have to use a little bit of intuition here. Which way would the, it would fall away from the wall? Friction is going to oppose that. So this is the correct direction for F at A. And we're going to come up here and we're going to say that right here, here's our location of the individual that has a W of, what is the, 180 LBs. And this is X. That's our distance X. That's what we're look, looking to solve for. I pause. I have a ladder man free body diagram. Is it, did I leave anything out? Is it complete? Yeah, we want to include maybe the 60 degree piece of information. 60 degrees, helpful. Lengths, I could have included the length. L is equal to 10 foot. Can tell me, can, can, can you tell, what is this? This is the H, isn't it? The height. And this is some maximum distance D, right? Can you, it's simple algebra or trigonometry to get H and D, right? H is 10 times the sine of 60, 60 degrees. And then what is D? D is equal to, yeah, D is equal to 10 times cosine 60 degrees, true? All right, all right. Now, <clears throat> which one do you want to do first to calculate x? We want to do some of the moments, some of the forces. If some of the forces in which direction, what do you want to do? Okay, let's do that. Let's do sum of the forces in the x is equal to 0. If you do sum of the forces in x equal to 0, you have f of a equal to n sub b. But what was f of a, that static friction at the base, right at the point of slipping? Right at the point of slipping, that's mu sub s times n sub a. But you also had the sum of the forces whoops, in the y equal to 0. And what does that give us? Sum of the forces in the y equal to 0. That the weight of the man on the ladder is equal to the normal at the ground. So we can then use that to substitute here. And you find that the F of A is equal to 180 times 0.4, 72 pounds, which then gives you N sub B is equal to 72 pounds. All right. So we got n sub b, and we actually didn't use the moment equation. But if you would have written the sum of the moments about point A equal to 0, 
you would have found that the weight times that unknown distance x that we want to solve for makes it want to spin in the clockwise direction equal to n sub b times that perpendicular distance which is 10 sine of 60 foot and we just solve for n sub b right and we know what the weight is hence we solve for the distance x and it comes in at 3.46 foot and then you just check the distance between the base of the ladder and the wall is five foot that 3.46 fits in that range All right does that make sense all right. I believe you've solved box pushing problems in your physics class. I, I can show you box pushing problems on almost any physics, high school physics as well as college physics. Let's continue the tradition. Let's solve box pushing problems. So we have a certain weight man, 100, no, 225 pound man. He's pushing horizontally on a 350-pound crate, okay? Uh, from the illustration, is he pushing in the middle of the crate, the bottom of the crate, or the top of the crate? Top of the crate. You had to look at the illustration. And he's pushing horizontally. Does that mean he's pushing some down, pushing some up? No, pushing horizontally, just pushing horizontally on that crate. So if you did the free body diagram of the crate, you would have the force that the man exerts between, you know, pushing on it. Maybe, maybe you put that's a P, I don't know. Maybe you put it's F, or, uh, whatever notation you introduce for the crate. And then you're going to have the weight of the crate, WC. And then you're going to have that normal force at the bottom of the, between the floor and the crate, N sub C. And which direction is the friction between the floor and the crate going to act on the crate, the bottom of the crate? Isn't it going to be like this? F of C by the subscript C, okay, I don't know. It's, con it's between the crate and the floor, C for crate. All right. Let's go ahead and do a very crude free body diagram of the man. There's really not, you, sometimes you can solve problems without doing free body diagrams of everything that's in there. I think we saw that last time. Oh, I could do a free body diagram of that part too. Well, I don't need it. I can answer all the questions that were asked without going to it. But let's go ahead and do this. So then we're going to have the weight of the man. And we'll have the normal force between the floor and the man. And which way is the friction, which are between the bottom of the shoes and the floor, going to act on the man? Well, the floor is actually going to sense pushing it, the man to the right because the shoes are pushing the floor in the opposite direction. That makes sense? All right. Now, the crate has dimensions three foot by three foot by three foot. So this dimension, I'm not going to put it in a free body diagram, clutters it up a little bit. Three foot and then three foot and then three foot deep. Okay. The coefficient of st uh, friction, static friction, between the man and the floor is 0.6. So mu sub s is 0.6. Ed, between the crate and the floor, mu sub s is 0.4. Can the man move the crate? Question, yes or no? Well, let me pick it up here. I, know, I wish I had more time to let you solve every problem by yourself. But if you do a free body diagram on the man and then you analyze it, what is the sum of the forces in the Y give us? It gives us N sub M, doesn't it? And N sub M is the weight of the man, which is 225 pounds. Okay. Once I have that, I get the F S of the man. That's the maximum frictional force that the shoes can exert 
when the man's pushing, you know, the shoes on the concrete, that becomes 0.6 mu sub s times n sub m. And so what does that roll in at? 135 pounds. If somebody has a calculator, can they double check me? Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. So now we know that that is true. You do the sum of the forces in the x, and you conclude that P is a maximum of 135 pounds. If you did get this to increase, you could push on the crate with a greater force. All right. Now, we analyzed the crate. We're coming over here with 135 pounds. And what type of motion can the crate exhibit if it does move? How can it move? Describe this, how it could possibly move. Slide as well as tip. Tip or slip? Tip or slip? All right. Let's do slip first. You basically got to check both. But this one has such a wide base, I don't think it's in jeopardy of tipping as much as slipping. But if somebody came in and says, oh, no, it's a one foot and three foot tall, guess what it's going to do? It's going to tip more readily. But it's a three foot by three foot. So let's check slip. So if we're coming in there, what does F of... Uh, C need to be for equilibrium, 135, is that true? And then what is F of SC, which is the maximum, the limiting? That would be the weight of the crate, 350. I'm kind of skipping a step there, some of the forces in the Y. Some of the forces in the Y give you that WC is equal to N sub C. Then multiply that by the coefficient of static friction, mu sub s of 0.4. And so what is our maximum? 140. So does the crate slip? No. No. The crate's no slip. Let's go ahead and check tipping, though. How do you check tipping? Well... What happens is the when you start to tip, what point does it tip over? Does it tip over this corner of the crate, this corner of the crate, this corner of the crate, or that corner of the crate? The last corner that I sketched, right? It's going to start to tip. That means it's going to rotate around this point right here. Okay. Well, as you start loading up with P, what will happen is, is you'll start walking over, walking over, walking over where, where the location of the support is for the normal force under the crate. If you don't push on it, it'll be precisely under the center of gravity of the crate. But as you're pushing on it, it's like it's, it's less uh, contact force in this side and more contact force. And at the point, you, you shifted it and it's all right under right there. That's where N sub C. N sub C can't be any further out than this corner. If it's at that corner, it's tipping. It's tipping. All right. So uh, you put the N sub C, or actually what you do is you, you solve for distance X where N sub C should be located. Then you compare. Is X greater than 1.5 or is x less than 1.5? 1 1.5 is that half distance between the center to that corner. So if it's less, you're good. It's not going to tip. If it's greater, you're tipping. If it's equal to 1.5, you're right at the cusp of tipping. All right. So what is that x? Solving for that x for this problem. You do the sum of the moments about what do you want to do to sum of the moments about? We already know what N sub C is. That's equal to the weight of the crate. That's equal to the 350 pounds. You want to do the sum of the moments around 0.0? It's easy enough to do right here. Weight of the crate goes through it. 
the force, frictional force, F of C goes right through it. Those two go out of the equation. So you do the sum of the moments around point O equal to zero. You'll get that P times three foot balanced by N sub C times the unknown X that you solve for X. What does X come in at? 1.16 foot. And that's less than one and a half, so there's no tip. Does that make sense? We got a couple thumbs up, a couple nods, ready to press forward. Well, we just can't stop there. The same man, the same crate, same shoes, same floor, same weights. But the man now pushes upward on the crate with a, not a comp horizontal, but with a 15 degree upward thrust. Can you envision that? Will the crate move? It could slip, it could tip, it could do both. Well, let me pick it up here. I wish I could spend more time doing this, but uh, right away we had before the force P that the man could exert on the crate was 135 pounds. Do you think he can still only exert 135, or do you think the force, the magnitude of the force will go up or go down it, uh, from 30, 135? What do you think? It'll go up, and it does go up. It goes up to 166.5 pounds. Why does it go up? Because actually this uh, downward force on the man helps put more weight to the shoes. The normal force increases, hence the friction, limiting friction force increases. So once we calculate that, then we drop over to the crate. And I like to think about you still have a horizontal component and you have now a little vertical component lifting on that corner of the crate. You still have the weight in the middle. You could march over this normal force all the way to the edge if it's going to be on the verge of tipping. And then we also have this frictional force. And if we're interested in slipping, it's right at that critical limiting frictional force. Okay. And so you, you have... All the dimensions, you can pick off the two components of that upward force, P. You do the sum of the moments, sum of the forces in the X and the Y. And basically you find that, yes, it will slip. And not only will it slip, but it all will also tip. And when you calculate that X, it's like 1.783 foot, which is greater than 1.5. So if you actually were able to give it your all at 15 degrees, it's not going to be stationary. It's going to slip, tip. Now, which one does it happen first? Well, we didn't ask that question. Maybe the individual starts to dip down and starts to push up and up and up until he tries to go to 15 degrees. At around uh, 3 to 4 degrees, I made the calculation somewhere. At around 3 degrees, he'll start to slip. So in the interest of time, I encourage you to take a look at that problem. Let's press forward. We have two blocks that are identical. When they have identical blocks, do they have the same weight? Yeah. And they have then the same um, coefficient of static friction is the same in all contacting surfaces. You have an angle of inclination theta, and you also have this, this cable that goes around a pulley, around a pulley, to attaches. So it attaches to the block A, and it goes, the cable goes through the pulley, which then the pulley attaches to block B. All right. They don't tell us the tension in the cable, but they ask, calculate the inclination angle theta at which the blocks begin to slide. Well, if theta was zero, nothing's going to slide. But as you start to increase theta, increase theta, something's going to start to slide. Now, this is important to figure out what's going to start to slide because of the tension in the cable. It's like, what? I, what's going to happen? Is block B going to slide up and block A slide down or the opposite? 
And what you can do is you can make a bad guess, run the numbers, get a angle that would say, oh, theta has to be like this, negative theta, and then you say, oops, I, I, I guessed which way they slide wrong. <laughs> All right, so if you guess that the slide block A slides down and block B slides up, you'll get a reasonable value for theta. It won't be a negative answer for theta. Well, how do we get that answer for what is that maximum inclination angle theta? This grand strategy is get a free body diagram for A, free body diagram for B, do the equations of motion or that are equilibrium, so you avoid that motion, you're at the cusp of motion, and then solve, solve for theta. So what does the free body diagram for block A look like? You think you have the weight going down? That's a bad looking W, but there's a W. If it's sliding down, we're going to have the frictional force between A and B. Let's call it FA. We'll have the normal force between A and B, N sub A. And we have also our tension force acting on it. We do a free body diagram of block B. It has the weight acting down. It has the normal force from A on its top acting down. So just like these are equal and opposite, that don't they match in the free body diagram? The two free body diagrams, aren't they consistent for N sub A? And then likewise, F of A, the top of block B feels a downward force because A is sliding down and B is sliding up. All right. Well, what about down here? You're going to get the ground. If B is sliding up, there's also a downward FB. And then we have N sub B like that. And we're going to have 2T. Why 2T? Well, include the pulley in it. It's a massless pulley, and you have two tensions. So we have our free body diagrams. What does equilibrium, some of the forces? Now, the other thing is we always do this X and Y. You don't have to do X and Y that are perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertical. You could do X and Y. And this may be one of those cases where you go with a slightly rotated coordinate system, rotated by the angle theta. Right? Okay. So if you look at the block A and you do the free body diagram, some of the forces in the X that are sloped, what do you get? Tension moving in the positive X. Friction on the bottom in the positive X. And then we have to decompose that weight in the two components, it'll be the weight times the sine of the angle theta in the negative. So I put it on the other side, equal sign. Equilibrium equation in the x. Look good? How about the equilibrium equation in the y? Well, pushing up is n sub a, pushing down is the weight times the cosine of theta. And then because it's on the verge of slipping, they want that maximum inclination angle, we can replace f of a by mu times n sub a. If you're brand new to this game, somebody will say, oh, that's the weight of block a, is it? No, it's not the weight of block A. It's that normal contact force between the two. Come over here, free equilibrium equations. So we're going to have F of A downward, F of B downward, the weight times the sine of theta. Because A and B have the same weight, we don't put weight A, weight B. They have the, they're the same weight. And then you have 2T pulling up. 
Does that equation look good? And then equilibrium in the y will have n sub a acting at the top pushing down plus the weight times the cosine of the angle theta, gravity, weight, equal to n sub b at the bottom pushing up. We also have the friction. F of b is equal to the same coefficient of static friction times n sub b. Is you take this equation and put n sub a here, then f of a there, then t over here, get rid of the t's. You're, you just got all these equations, you're eliminating them, and you're getting it down to what you can do. And then you're going to do the same thing here. You'll have the n sub, this, this n sub a also goes right over here. Then the n sub b down there. Then the f of b up there, as well as the f of a up there. You'll have one equation, and the equation will look something like the tangent of the inclination angle theta is equal to 5 times, what was the steps here? Math. you got to do it right. And I just did the little arrows to show you that. So the interest of time, you can do that. And so the maximum inclination angle theta is the arc tan of 5 times mu sub f. It depends on what that coefficient of static friction is. If it's very high, you could take it up higher. If it's not slippery, it's going to be lower. All right. I need to press forward looking at the clock. Calculate the smallest horizontal force required to move the wedge to the right. So this is our wedge right here, and we want to move it to the right. As it moves to the right, you're basically going to be sliding along this surface and along that contact. So there's two places that are going to resist it due to friction. All right. Uh, the coefficient of static friction is 0.3 at all the contacting surfaces. Again, this is contacting surface, contacting surface. Set uh, theta equal to 15 degrees. So this is the angle of the wedge, 15 degrees right there. And F is the load up on this handle of 400 newtons. So there it is. Neglect the weight of the wedge. So this is our lever, and this is our wedge, right? Aren't we asked to find the smallest P? How do I begin? For this problem, it looks like we would need two free body diagrams, one for the wedge and one for the lever. <coughs> All right. So let's go ahead and get our free body diagram of the wedge. All right, so we're going to have P loading it. We'll have our friction on the bottom. They didn't give it a name on that bottom surface, lower or surface one, if you wanted to call it. I know they put C up here for contact and B over here and A over there. Maybe we call that D. You want to call it D? So we'll call it F at D. And then you're going to have N at D. You'll have N at C, and you'll have F at C. Did I get all the directions right? Because if you don't, then we have negative signs, and it throws the math off. What is this angle right here? 15 degrees. Right? Just like this is sloped up 15 degrees, if you take it. That's kinked over 15 degrees. N sub C is kinked over. Right? All right. Uh, likewise, if you wanted to, you could say, what's that angle right there? 15 degrees for F of C up. All right. Okay. If you do the sum of the forces in the X, I know I didn't get the lever. Let's get the lever free body diagram. 
All right, so we'll have F up here. We have the reaction at the pin B. You can think about it for a while, but probably do the other one first. You're going to have this force uh, um, at 15 degrees. That's N sub C. And you're going to have this one at 15 degrees down. That's F of C. And now if I look at it, I probably going to have some BX and BY. What do you think? Do this. This is the way I do it. If that pin failed, would this arm rotate that way up? Would, it, would, would the corner of that lever go that way, or would it go that way? If, if pin B failed, it would go up, meaning that I probably have a positive BX in that direction and a positive BY in that direction. B, X, and B, Y. All right. So now we can go and do our equilibrium equation. Some of the forces in the X, what does that give us? P is pushing the positive X. What's resisting? We have the frictional force at D. We have the frictional force at C, but we have that uh, cosine of the angle 15 degrees to pick off that component. And then we have one more, the normal force at C times the sine of 15 degrees. All right, how about for the Y? Coming up, we have N sub D. We have F of C times the sine of theta. And going down, we have N sub C times the cosine of theta. I don't really want to calculate BX and BY. One great way to avoid BX and BY, a reaction at a pin support that I really am not that interested in, is do the sum of the moments around point B. So if I do the sum of the moments around point B must equal to zero at equilibrium, I get an equation, do I not? Now, this diagram is a little challenging. If I look at B, they draw the horizontal. And then right here, the contact point for C in that lever, there's a 20 millimeter gap or distance, separation distance. So you bust the components of the normal force at C into the X and the Y and uh, the frictional force at C into the X and the Y, and then you have both of these moment arm distances around B. So you're going to pick up four contributions to the moment just from what's happening at C. All right, let's do the easy one first. What about F? We know what that F is. That's 400 newtons. What's that moment arm distance around point B? 0.45 meter. All right. Then we have the normal force at C. If you pick off the sine of theta, what's that's that's that um, um, it's it's like this component right there on N sub C, and it has a perpendicular distance around point B, point O two. 0.02, and doesn't that make it want to rotate in the counterclockwise, the same as P? All right. Then you take the frictional force at C. Take a look. This is our frictional force at C. Pick off that horizontal component, which has the same moment arm distance. But that'll give us uh, the cosine of theta times 0.02. Then I'm going to pick off the vertical component of C. Um, let me think about that for a minute. That makes it want to rotate the other way. Let's pick off the vertical component of F of C. So it'll be plus F of C times the sine of theta. That's this downward F of C component. 
and then that moment arm distance is 0.3 meter. And the only one making it want to rotate in the counterclockwise is n sub c times cosine of theta with a moment arm distance of 0.3. So at this point, uh, it's like check. I know what that F is. I know the distances. You, um, you can replace F of C by mu sub S, which is the same mu sub S, times N sub C, true. Uh, mu sub S times N sub C. So I can pull out N sub C out of this equation and we can actually solve for this equation. We can solve for n sub c. n sub c comes in at 7045 newtons. One equation, actually, with one unknown. Then you can solve for f of c, which is just mu sub s, 0.3, times that n sub c, comes in at 211.3 newtons. Then we can come back and solve, like here's our n sub c, our f of c. You can come back and solve for the, you can do it also with this equation, n sub c, f of c. You can get the normal force at the bottom contact surface, 620 six newtons as well as the friction force at that bottom 188 newtons and then you can solve for p this last equation p comes in at 574 newtons yeah that's f of d thank you f of d Thank you. Yeah. What was the hard part? Getting the two free body diagrams. Then getting our equations of equilibrium. Then the math is just, okay, I can eliminate here and combine here and this substitute, and then, oh, finally, I got P. Solve for P. All right. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time.